King Center for Strategy and a research fellow at the U.S. Naval War College. James helped found the King's um, Wargaming Network in 2018, having led naval wargaming research in the War Studies Department since 2016. At the same time, he pioneered a global network for maritime and naval thinkers focused on space research, leading to 2019 becoming King's leading researcher in maritime strategy and space. In 2020, he also became a member of the King's Defense Studies Air and Space Institute and affiliated with the Space Security Research Group. Between 2019 and 2023, uh, James is the co-director of the Corbett 100 Project, which marks the centenary of the death of strategist and naval historian Sir Julian Corbett. The project also supports events such as Falklands 40. After spending significant research time with the Royal Navy, he completed his Master's of Research degree at Plymouth University in England in 2015 and is due to wrap up his PhD at, um, in King shortly. We all know how that goes with the PhD students. Our second panelist is, is Dr. Jonathan Chavon, who is a commander with CSG-4 Air C2 Executive Officer. He has earned his, um, what is education here? He graduated from, he has an MA from Texas um, A&M University with a bachelor's uh, and an MA from American Military University. He is a graduate, 1997 graduate of Baylor University with a Bachelor of Arts in History and a minor and a double minor in Political Science and Russian Studies. He um, studied at Texas at AMU in Military Studies and Land Warfare in 20, 2005 and an MA from Texas A&M University of Military History in 2011. In 2016, he graduated from Texas A&M University with a Doctor of Philosophy and PhD in Military Naval History, probably working under John, uh, uh, Brian, Michael. Jim Bradford. Yeah, okay. And focusing on the role of U.S. Navy and Marine Corps in the post-World War II China and the early Cold War in East Asia. Mr. Joe Petrelli, Petrelli, am I pronouncing? Petrichelli. Oh, pardon? Petrichelli. Pet Petrichelli. Okay. Petrichelli, like in the show. Okay. <laughs> PhD candidate at George Mason University. In addition to being a former submarine officer, current reservist, defense analyst, and pre-doctoral fellow at, at NHHC, in his civilian role, he is an analyst at the systems planning and analysis supporting the Navy requirements and acquisition programs. At George Mason University, he is studying the doctoral evolution in the post-World War II Navy, looking at the mechanisms of change in the peacetime Navy. All three of these have written very interesting papers and very, very good papers, I might add. And our first panelist is Mr. James Smith, who's coming from a cyber. Okay, can you uh, hear me over there? Yeah, we sure can, James. Okay, I shall try the uh, share screen. Okay. Okay, that should uh, work now. Okay, good evening from here in England and uh, good afternoon to those at the US Naval Academy. Uh, it's been a particular privilege to present at the McMullen Naval History Conference in 2017 and 2019, uh, which ran parallel to my PhD research here at King's College London in the Department of War Studies. Uh, in 2017 and 2019, I discussed some of my new research that used primary source and original documentary evidence about the process of defense unification and its relationship with the development of strategic theory in Britain and the United States. Uh, a defense unification is so far reaching that a great number of topics and avenues are available to be discussed. One of these, space, has been a militarized front and increasingly became an issue as my research progressed. In 2017, I discussed how the British Admiralty had argued against unification in the 1950s and 1960s only to be let down by one of their own, Earl Newman McBatten. Supported by Army and RAF voices, he realized they had the opportunity to challenge the long-standing dominance of the Royal Navy in defense policy. Unification instead secured a continental strategy in Britain, which was alien and hostile to Britain's strategic experience. In 2019, utilizing new research, I discussed the reality of how close the US Navy had come to the had came close to abolition in the post-Second World War decade. I further discuss similarities and differences in the unification process between America and Britain, but also how perceptions of sea power in America were changed by the unification experience. This occurred in a context and time where America pondered 
what exactly superpower entailed and the role it had in the future defending liberty and the around the world, particularly against communism and other threats. Defense unification was the most significant change to the defense establishment in the history of defense in Washington, D.C. and London. There was no part of defense untouched by this change. It reshaped civil military relations, challenged the powers of the military service chiefs, and contrary to political claims, it enabled all out rivalry between the military services or granting unyielding power to the financial controllers and political levers of the state. It was a particularly traumatic event in the history of navies and sea power. The status quo navies had enjoyed prior to 1945 were challenged like never before. Unification changed how the state and national culture viewed navies. Navy's roles were changed and often degraded, irrelevant of if the Navy was controlled by a sea power state island nation or a continental sea power. America had tirelessly attempted to create a quasi sea power state far beyond building and maintaining a Navy, often in competition to the Royal Navy, only to have to revisit fundamentals of what the Navy meant to the nation in the latter half of the 20th century. Unification swept away the independent service departments and ministries such as the Admiralty and Freestanding Department of the Navy and merged them into a centralized, tripartite, homogenized defense department under the leadership of an all-powerful Secretary of Defense. Claims that unification enabled better national strategy and defense policy are somewhat overstated, and my PhD research goes into this far more depth than I can discuss today. But it's important to understand and keep in mind the scale, impact, and influence of change that was unification. World events such as the Cold War's increase in intensity, the Cuban Missile Crisis, and the Vietnam War in the 1960s overtook the agenda, while also most politicians and military were exhausted with many issues that occurred as a result of unification. Perceptions of naval history after 1945 have become somewhat dominated by terms like fall in decline. We've probably all heard that, navies in fall in decline. But these terms have been damaging to research focusing on post-1945, but also the development of strategic thought in public policy. It is by no coincidence that navies have been misunderstood after 1945 and even less by the public due to failures in historical methodology covering the period. Navies retained an important role as any time before, influences they always have far beyond what occurs at sea. Questions related to the Cold War, such as if American sea power resulted in a Soviet sea power response or vice versa, cannot be removed from the broader context, such as the Cold War going hot and spread of communism. The threat of communism overtaking the world fueled paranoia and distractions towards the Korean and Vietnam Wars. However, even with the success of the Second World War, technological change was once again being used to fuel unification debates in Washington, D.C. against the Navy. This was further aided by the combination of the U.S. Army, U.S. Air Force, and anti-naval President Truman. And as a result, the years of 1945 to 1950 were probably the toughest the U.S. Navy has faced in peacetime. The U.S. Army, supported by those who wanted a separate Air Force, utilized the disaster at Pearl Harbor to further the agenda to unify defense. This was only accelerated by the use of the atomic bomb and subsequently its impact on warfare, which overwhelmed debate, often leading to panic call, panicked calls for change to the future of warfare. The future seemed that you could bomb your way out of any foreign policy issue. This approach clashed with navies who were not so keen to disregard experience and were ultimately proven right with nuclear deterrence. But technological advancement had always been about testing the limits of warfare, human endurance and new frontiers. Just as the seas were about exploration, but also military power, the final frontier, space, was no different and closely aligned as a strategic maritime domain because it influenced what happened on Earth, which is really planet ocean. And little different, the sea power influencing what happens on land and the air over it. Defence organisation and space are closely bound, not just because of historical links that saw the race between the two superpowers of the past, the Soviet Union and the United States, but of recent parallels where space has increasingly taken prominence in the mind of hostile actors and old alliances. The creation of Space Force as part of the Department of the Air Force is driven by cultural historical ties. It could be viewed that the modern day response to challenges in space connect to historic complaints at the time of unification where land and air voices disliked Navy Department control of the US Marines. Amphibious forces were used to great effect to enhance arguments in the late 1940s and 1950s to hold back some calls from the Air Force against aircraft carriers. Debates over aircraft carriers saw the bitterest of division between the military. It was a topic which was a direct result of haphazard arrangements and legal changes for political and military power at the Pentagon during and after the National Security Act in 1947. 
Technology was central to the debates that the Navy found itself in and occurred post-war. The cost of new technologies, many foundational to space exploration, fueled calls by politicians for greater centralization to control budgets. The missile age and development of rockets in the 1950s was a costly program that highlighted duplication and waste in defense. But this was a period where an investment to find a new competitive edge or frontier to dominate was compelling the services to debate and argue for investment. The connection between unification and space were not just marked by the passing of time and the development of missiles and rockets, but also the process of unification would, by 1955, the year many claim to be the beginning of the space race, to find that the US Navy in a position to be pushing by 1957 for a civilian space program. By 1955, the Navy wanted and needed to win a public argument for American sea power, but more importantly, it's better to defeat the Soviets with strategy, of which it argued sea power was essential. The concern was that policymakers could turn the short-term tactical solutions, a Cold War gone hot, that land and air power theorists had thrown against investment in the Navy. The Navy treated the world strategically while the other service looked at tactical responses during this period. Furthermore, the Navy saw its function to be of use in peace and war. A prolonged Cold War would cost vast amounts of money and effort, but so did the cost of quick military solutions, some that could end in the destruction of humankind. Politicians viewed the only way to control competing programs was by asserting greater civilian control in an ever centralized, unified defense. The space race is classified as starting in 1955. However, it was in 1945 with intelligence from the British Admiralty and MI6, US forces were tasked to rush across defeated Nazi Germany to capture lead German rocket scientist Werner von Braun and his V2 rocket team. Von Braun had developed German rockets that destroyed parts of English towns and cities, but his heart remained on space exploration. American, British and Soviet mines turned to applications for rockets, not least also the application of equipment atomic and later nuclear warheads. Half of these German teams ended up in the United States and the other in Soviet Russia. By 1955, United States rockets and thoughts of space remained poorly organized, lackluster and ineffective. Meanwhile, the Soviets embraced the military application of rockets and the advantage of dominating space. As a result, they made great strides in rocket propulsion that resulted in them being far ahead of the United States and United Nations. The Soviets ultimately led the space race until 1969. The hopes of a peaceful world had already been shattered within a matter of years at the end of the Second World War. The Korean War not only provided an essential demonstration of sea power that helped the US Navy seek funding for its future aircraft carriers and nuclear research plans, eventually nuclear propulsion and Admiral Rickover's vision of nuclear navy. But also Korea marked a turning point where missiles and rockets rather than shells appealed the way ahead for the Navy. A decade post-war battling anti-naval settlement in Washington DC saw CNO Ernest J. King, CNO Denfield, Admiral Radford, James Foster and Arlie Burke amongst others start to pay dividend even if unification resulted in the collapse of hopes to take American defense policy solely back to the sea. President Eisenhower saw unification as a root of issues in American defense policy planning, so aptly demonstrated by issues and lack of preparedness, including mismanagement of finances and project overruns at the Pentagon in the Korean War. By 1955, the U.S. Navy was under new leadership, under uh, unafraid to challenge Eisenhower's centralization doctrine. CNO Burke found the traditional constitutional charge to build and maintain a navy, offering little protection. Burke's experience of Washington politics had attuned him to the once strong position held by the Navy no longer existed. The Navy Department sought to make unification work for the Navy, not least through public relations and efforts to secure the Navy's role in national defense and foreign policy. The Navy of 1955 to 1958 was at a critical juncture. Investment for nuclear propulsion and nuclear weapon armed submarines provided leverage that had lacked in the 1940s against hostile forces and the policy of absolute air power. But to secure this momentum required negotiating through layers of bureaucracy that had not existed prior to unification, something that Burke and the Navy Department saw as unconstitutional and unnecessary. The launch of the Soviet satellite Sputnik shocked Americans in 1957. The once security that farms and states far removed from the politics of Washington DC were shattered and calls for investment in national defense were ramped up as a result. The goal that President Eisenhower sought a more centralized control with layers of civilian oversight and a supreme military chief were promptly discarded when Congress heatedly concluded the failure of effort on American advance in space as once again a failure within the Pentagon who was obsessed with reorganization. <laughs>
Sputnik crisis helped CNO Burke to, po to point out that unified defense had resulted in the Pentagon losing sight of its primary task, national defense. He also argued excessive centralization, inter-service rivalry, and power struggles made it difficult for the Navy to communicate why investment was important into American sea power, an other area that could be easily lost to the Soviets, just as it appeared was happening in space. He essentially tied the two together in a warning that was unfolding in real time before policymakers' eyes. The space race was a significant factor that ended decades of debates on unification that the US Navy had struggled with. The stark reality was that America could lose the Cold War, Korea had not been forgotten, and communism was spreading. While arguing for naval investments of a program to push by the Soviets, it was the Navy who became a key character in pushing for a civilian space program. Ultimately, it was NASA as a symbol of liberty and freedom that the Navy supported. For the Navy, it lost some political clout with the other services, including the Air Force, who spoke out against expenditure on civilianized space and NASA, even considering their undertone of the military and diplomatic themes to NASA's mission. It would be hardly surprising, considering Navy's historic and cultural relationship with exploration on the seas, that exploring a new frontier wouldn't interest them. Not only that, Soviet military and civilian dominance of space could set back military operations on Earth for the United Nations. Investment in space and defense would and did benefit the Navy. Burke's tenure as CNO was dominated by encouraging, as is normative for a continental state, to choose sea power to further foreign policy. Political battles and success of CNO Burke were forgotten, as would be seen in the Navy's battle for relevance in the 1970s, particularly with the American public. But it was no coincidence naval public relations of the 1960s could be often seen with the new astronauts of NASA and the image of space tied with images of the new nuclear Navy, all in efforts to make the service look modern and relevant. Burke released large numbers of Navy Department scientists to NASA, helping kickstart the Gemini and Apollo programs, but it's far from the end of the Navy's role with space. President Kennedy's long-term affection and admiration for the Navy and Admiral Burke helped further limit organizational changes that would be hostile to the U.S. Navy maintaining access to communicating its message to Congress. President Kennedy's immortal speech to Congress in the May of 1961 and September 1962, which used to go to the home, nearly word for word echoed encouragement for the Navy Department and Burke. Using declassified records as part of this research, it supports that Americans and Kennedy remain wary of the cost of the moon program. But it was Burke who pointed out to Kennedy, and I quote, who would want to live in an America that let the final frontier fall into Soviet hands because space, just as what was occurring on the seas, was about giving the Soviets a good beating. Investment in defense and space and the pace of global events ended the unification battles that started in the 1940s. America was far too busy fully engaged in all domains against the Soviets than to be fiddling with defense organization in Washington, D.C. However, space nor unification were finished business. The American moon landings in 1969 eventually closed the space race, which can be seen in the 21st century. What occurs in space, which is a maritime again, maritime domain, is once again worth pause for thought. Thank you. That was a very fine paper. Um, our next um, speaker is uh, Dr. Siobhan, who will be talking about um, the uh, Admiral Richard Byrd and his explorations in Antarctica, and of course, the, the controversies that he had raised inside the Navy. Thank you very much. Good to go. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Cold War was a global contest between superpowers, taking place in the most remote corners of the world. Recent scholarship has broadened its, its focus to have a better understanding of this conflict. And rather than focusing on just traditional hotspots such as Berlin or Havana or a few other familiar places like Moscow, the Cold War's global nature is more in focus today than ever before. Yet this new emphasis has seldom gone beyond the geographic limit of 60 degrees south latitude. 
That's what I'm going to talk to you about today. South of that latitude and what happened in Antarctica. In the 30s and 50s. Antarctica is a place that few of us give a second thought, and fewer still, fewer still of us have ever set foot upon, most likely. It remains a terra incognita, but for many reasons never seen to fall into either sphere of the bipolar Cold War world. This is due primarily to the Antarctic Treaty System that was begun in 1959, which, as a, for many of y'all know, some of the provisions, it, it prohibits the, the continent for use for military purposes. Yet for a brief period of time, Antarctica did become part of the Cold War. At its outset, superpower super rivalry did reach even the coldest, driest, most isolated continent on the planet. With its power diminished, and as a previous presenter pointed out, uh, it's in, in the midst of a power struggle with the US, U.S. Air Force, the U.S. Navy embarked on a forgotten expedition that tested the limits of what was achievable in the frigid southern waters, set the stage for the peaceful Antarctica of today. Today, I think you could say two, two versions of Antarctica exist. There's the one that Hollywood gives us of the dancing penguins <laughs> and uh, the happy-go-lucky Antarctica that you can just go on a cruise ship and visit. That's one vision I think we have today. The other is of scientists hard at work uh, working you know in incredibly difficult conditions uh, that most of us would just shudder at the thought of living in darkness for three or four months out of the year so those are our two visions today however first half of the 20th century I ar argue there was only one view of Antarctica as a romantic if, if savage unknown continent the last place on earth it's possible so we're probably all familiar with the general outlines of the geography, even if the place names maybe aren't as familiar to us and we don't look at this bottom of the map of the world as much as we should. I put on here a few important geographic locations that, of course, we all know Murdo Station, capital of Antarctica, for want of a better term. And Ernest Shackleton's 1909 camp is the uh, Orange Triangle. And Little America, which we're going to talk about today, which uh, I'll get to in just a moment. If you were to travel back to 1940 and ask the average American who they thought was the most famous U.S. naval officer, they probably would have answered Rear Admiral, Admiral Richard Burr. A 1912 graduate of this local institution, Burr had electrified the world with his exploits in the field of exploration. It seemed that there was no place on Earth beyond his reach. After serving in, in the First World War, he left active duty and embarked on a legendary career, pushing the boundaries of aviation and discovery. Next slide, please. His own words from his best selling 1938 memoir alone encaps encapsulate his all encompassing quest, writing, For 14 years or so of various expeditions, one succeeding the other, had occupied my time and thoughts to the exclusion of nearly everything else. In 1919, it was the Navy's transatlantic flight, 1925, Greenland, 1926, the North Pole, 1927, the Atlantic Ocean, and 2830, the South Pole, and 33 and 35, the Antarctic again. He got around. After his now controversial flight over the, over, over the North Pole in 1926, Byrd was awarded the Medal of Honor and promoted by Congress to the full rank of, of commander. In a, in a step that you could, I think you could say is unheard of in our modern Navy, Byrd was subsequently twice promoted to the rank of Rear Admiral in 1929. So, so you see him there on the left with uh, Frank and Roosevelt. The two of them had a, a, pretty much a two-decade friendship and partnership that ex existed until uh, Roosevelt's death in 1945. However, by the end of World War II, Burr's notoriety had, had been eclipsed by a new generation of naval heroes. After the conclusion of his, his expedition in 1939, Burr was recalled to active duty and spent the majority of the war in relative obscurity, serving in various staff roles and, and as an advisor to Ernest J. King. His most significant accomplishment was as a senior member of a survey mission to the South Pacific, where he surveyed the islands of the Marquesas, Numea, Palmyra, Bora Bora, and many others. Doesn't sound too bad, actually. Bird's expertise in aviation and geography greatly enhanced the mission's final report, which aided in the post-war world of establishing civil aviation routes. But Bird wanted to get back to where he belonged. And after the conclusion of the Second World War, and after taking part on board the USS Missouri at the surrender ceremonies, he authored a series of papers arguing for a, a, very, a concerted effort to return south. He said, use aircraft carriers and long-range planes to make a complete survey of the continent map its coast and interior, rejuvenate the Antarctic surface, and use the Antarctic as a polar scientific laboratory. With the help of his powerful brother, Virginia Senator Harry F. Byrd, Admiral Byrd began lobbying Washington for a large expedition south. Yeah, this begs the question, why would the U.S. Navy, 
dispatch a major expedition to the bottom of the world during its greatest de demobilization in history. But that is precisely what occurred. On August 26, 1946, the Vice Chief of Naval Operations, Admiral DeWitt Ramsey, announced the creation of the Antarctic Development Project and Operation High Jump, a large expedition scheduled for the Antarctic summer of January to March 1947. High Jump became a reality both of and in spite of Admiral Byrd himself. Byrd was not universally popular, to put it mildly, among the Navy, Navy leadership. Some felt his rank was undeserved and his accomplishments exaggerated. Byrd's biographer, Lyle Rose, wrote that among that Navy flag officers, Byrd was viewed as a vain, mystical, egocentric. His obsession with the Antarctic, lack of formal command experience, and his rapid promotion through acts of Congress bred resentment among some of the Navy's top admirals. But Byrd had three powerful headwinds behind his project, and as I'll explain in a second, some very heavy hitters in his corner. The first was Antarctic itself, the frozen continent which had been visited by only a handful of British and Argentinian sailors during the Second World War, was once again in the public eye. The age of Scott, Amundsen, and Shackleton was gone, and the nation states of the world had begun looking at the continent as an inexhaustible source of resources. Antarctica also offered the opportunity to train in polar conditions, similar to what we found in the Arctic. The relevance of naval power was the second reason. The newly created Air Force had used the defense reunification struggle to argue that future wars, as was previously discussed, would be won by the bomb alone. Navies were obsolete in this world. To counter this, naval planners were eager to demonstrate that modern fleets could perform missions that no Air Force could do. Admiral Nimitz, in, in the summer of 46, had author, authorized Operation Nanook, a small naval expedition that surveyed Baffin Bay and the east coast of Greenland. Interesting. Interesting event that came out of this was the uh, establishment of Thule Air Force Base, which was surveyed uh, that summer, and which, of course, now is a big uh, part of our Arctic uh, strategy. The Antarctic summer of, of January to March 1947 offered the perfect opportunity to train in the Southern Ocean, far from the prying eyes of Soviet watchers. As we'll see, even in the Antarctic, you couldn't get away from Russian eyes. The final reason was, of course, the Cold War itself. By the summer of 1946, the Standoff between the Soviet Union and the West had developed into something more than theoretical. In February, you had George Kennan and his long telegram. And in March, you had Winston Churchill's famous Iron Curtain speech. Byrd found a powerful ally, James Forsall, pictured in the center here in one of his famous pinstripe suits, uh, the current Navy Secretary and future Secretary of Defense. Forsall made opposition to the Soviet Union as a central bulwark of his policy. Here lay perhaps the most important reason for Operation Hijack. To get access to the world's last uninhabited region before the Russians did the same. In basic terms, this was a, the equivalent of, of a preemptive strategic maneuver. Hajim had five main objections, objectives. Excuse me. Test personnel and equipment, establish permanent, potential permanent bases, develop techniques and procedures for polar research, and essentially just for, polar, for furthering polar research. As you can see, that last one is the, the least important, probably, of, of the four. The last one, however, though, was consolidating and extending U.S. sovereignty over the practical areas of the continent. Although the U.S. had put forth numerous territorial claims, which other nations such as Argentina, Chile, and New Zealand had done so well as well, none of these were recognized under international law. But the most important objective was to demonstrate to the Soviets that the U.S. Navy was capable of a sustained global presence, even in the harshest of polar conditions. As one historian of, of the continent concludes, there was no pretense that high jump was driven by science. Instead of rigorous scientific and geographic priorities, the U.S. Navy was practicing for future war against the Soviet Union. Next slide, please. Task Force 68, the, the naval component of Operation High Jump, was minuscule compared to the enormous task forces of the Second World War, but by Antarctic standards was quite large. Divided into three groups, which you can see here. The east the central group was the largest. It comprised the uh, command ship Mount Olympus, two icebreakers, the Burton Island and Northwind, cargo ships Yancey and Merrick, and the submarine Senate, which I will get the submarine Senate, I will get back to you in a short moment. The eastern group had a, a seaplane carrier, carrier USS Pine Island, a uh, oiler USS Canesto, and a destroyer Brownson. The western group was also a similar signed, had a, a seaplane carrier, oiler, and a destroyer. Altogether, this was 4,000 U.S. Navy, Marine Corps, and civilian personnel. Byrd was not in command of this expedition, however. 
that honor fell to the recently promoted Rear Admiral Richard Cruiser. Byrd was officially the officer in charge, which was more or less a ceremonial role. He was there to advise, to uh, give his tremendous expertise, but not to command. The uh, next slide, please. The uh, last addition to the, uh, oh, sorry. So you see the Senate there on the left, and this is the U.S. Coastal Code Northwind. Uh, definitely the most important member of this expedition. Without it, the entire expedition would have been a disaster. She was brand new and one of the wind class, uh, very powerful icebreakers for her time. The center group was to, using the north wind, the center group was to cut up through the pack ice and establish a base near Byrd's original Little America base from his 1920s expeditions, while the eastern and western groups would map large swaths of the, of the, of the Antarctic coastline. Next slide, please. I just wanted to point this out. The last ship, ship that was assigned to the expedition, almost as a kind of a way of saying, hey, we can put a fleet carrier in the Antarctic, was the USS Philippine Sea, the last of the Essex class carriers. I was wondering what Jimmy Doolittle would think of this picture <laughs> if he ever saw this. Maybe he did. As a way of extending the range of the expedition, these R4D cargo aircraft were modified for use on a carrier and launched off the deck and fitted with uh, ski and uh, rocket propulsion for taking off from the Antarctic after landing. So it was a very innovative uh, technology for this expedition. The high jump was hastily organized during the summer and fall and headed south. Many military and scientific innovations planned for the expedition were utilized, again, such as the R4D aircraft. The sole encounter, excuse me, the sole encounter with the Soviet Union occurred when the Eastern Group, under Captain George Dufek, under on board the Pine Island, encountered the Russian whaler Slava and her support craft. I wonder what she was doing down there. <laughs> Naval communications with the, between the two ships was terse but professional. After more than four months of surveying and mapping the continent, the task force returned home in April 1947. Next slide, please. So this is just some dramatic shots. This is the uh, cargo ship uh, Yancey being pulled by the Americas in the middle there. And at the far left, you see the uh, north wind, I believe. So they've managed to get all the way up to uh, what would become the Little America, the Little America 5, uh, which was you know, the fifth version of Bird's original base. Next slide, please. So just to kind of show here, the, I put, the only major accident that occurred during the expedition was at the Red Triangle of Thurston Island. One of the PBM uh, Marin aircraft crashed, actually it exploded. Three, three crew members were lost. And uh, gradually one of the crew members, he suffered frostbite and had to have all of his limbs amputated. So even though this was a civilian, or rather a, a peacetime mission, we had a lot of civilians on board, so extremely dangerous. And I want to emphasize that even though this was the summer in, in, in Antarctica, hmm. weather conditions were atrocious. And uh, we had a lot to learn about operating at these latitudes. Next slide, please. This is a, I put this up as a great picture of what the crews did when they had some spare time. On the right, this is Dr. Paul Seifel. He is one of Bird's boys, you could say, one of his trusted lieutenants. Before Bird's passing, he had more time than anyone in, in, in Antarctica, even more than Bird did. So for Bird, he was the explorer. Seifel was the science. Half of their expeditions. So here you see them recovering. This is known as the crab eater seal. It's huge. Uh, and that's the Mount Olympus behind them, flagship. Operation High Jump was a modest operation of success and a propaganda triumph for the Navy. And it seemed for a time that Byrd's dominance in polar operations would continue. The second Antarctic mission, uncreatively entitled High Jump 2, was authorized for the 1949-1950 season. But here Byrd's luck ran out. By 1949, Harry Truman felt as it, it no longer felt as encumbered by Roosevelt's shadow. Actually, next slide, please. Sorry for the quality of this. Uh, so this is uh, Bird returning from high jump in April of 47, uh, which giving Secretary <laughs> Forrest a little gift uh, <laughs> during their adventures. By 1949, Harry Truman felt no longer felt as encumbered by Roosevelt's shadow, and even worse for Richard Byrd, his brother, had turned against some of the president's policies. Even worse, though, James Forrestal, uh, in 1949, suffering from mental and physical exhaustion, had resigned as Secretary of Defense and then famously committed suicide. Replaced by the notoriously pro-Air Force Lewis Johnson, the Navy could no longer count on, on expenditures for Antarctica. 
High Jump was canceled. High Jump 2 was canceled for reasons of the kind. Unofficially, politics killed the project. Just I don't know, we got to move along, along here. Of course, we all know the story. In the summer of 1950, North Korea invaded the southern half of the Korean Peninsula. The world's attention became focused on Asia. As for Byrd, he continued to advise the Antarctic Research Project, what was largely a ceremonial figure, if a highly respected one. Yet the Russians began to pop up in, un, 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 in, in surprising places. In 1949, the Soviet Union held an important meeting of the All Union Geographical Society in Leningrad and proclaimed their territorial rights to Antarctica based on the Russian voyages of Thaddeus von Bellinghausen and Mikhail Lazarev in 1819 and 1821. Fears that the Russians may press their rights to the continent set alarm in the State Department and, and in Australia as well. Stalin's death brought a lessening of Cold War tensions, as well as opportunities for the U.S. Navy to return to Antarctica. As part of this, the U.S. agreed to establish the International Geophysical Year for 1957-58, an 18 months period of international study of the polar regions. Although this was cloaked in a scientific advancement, it offered a, a several, dip, several diplomatic opportunity to subvert future Soviet expansion in the region. The next few years saw a flurry of Antarctic activity, both military and diplomatic. In a dramatic return to the region, the Navy authorized Operation Deep Freeze of the summer of 1955-56, comprised of nine ships including three icebreakers, and led by now Rear Admiral George Dufek. This expedition was more narrowly focused on scientific objectives and officially established McMurdo Station, which has become a permanent location for the U.S. ever since. Interestingly enough, uh, Upon his return from the Antarctic, Dufek encountered the same Russian whaling ship, the Slava, that he had encountered several years before during high jump. Welcomed on board by the Russian captain, Alexei Solyanik, Dufek was treated to the typical Russian extravagance of caviar, lobster, and of course, large amounts of vodka. <laughs> Both men toasted each other's success in the Antarctic, and Dufek could only marvel at the easing of Cold War tensions between the two countries. Two years later, this, the U.S. invited 11 countries to the, a conference on the future of Antarctica. Of course, we won't go into the details of that, but it, essentially it prevented the Soviet Union from establishing a military foothold, which was the original idea of high jump in the first place. And due to this treaty, the continent was spared the turmoil of the Cold War that involved the rest of the world. Next slide, please. Richard Byrd did not live to see the complex diplomacy of his beloved Antarctic play out. By the winter of 1957, his health was failing, Due to, due to repeated privations endured on his long polar expeditions. On the morning of February 21st, 1957, a high level Navy delegation, including Chief of Naval Operations Early Burke, paid their respects to the dying Admiral in Boston, to bestow the Medal of Freedom, the nation's highest civilian award. They encountered a skeletal remnant of the energetic explorer they once knew, but also a man who had lost none of his military bearing. Bird passed away two weeks later and was buried at Arlington National Cemetery. Many memorials were held for him, but the most poignant occurred at the newly established McMurdo Chapel, where U.S. military personnel were joined by none other than Sir Edmund Hillary, the recent conqueror of Mount Everest. At the conclusion of the service, Bert, the chapel bell was tolled five times, one for each of Byrd's expeditions to the Antarctic. Byrd is probably remembered best for his, his pre-World War II feats of discovery and aviation, but in many ways, Operation High Jump was his most influential achievement. James Forstall and the Navy leadership could never have received the public and government support for the expedition without Byrd at the helm. The Cold War tensions also made it possible. The operation was undeniably part of the Cold War and also of the new era of the continent, one guided by science and diplomacy other than war. Byrd's vision for the continent was a complex mixture of reverence, wonder, and nationalism, and he was determined that the U.S. take the lead in exploration of the continent. He also knew the future would be centered around the pursuit of scientific knowledge. With his wry wit, he summarized the true importance of polar expedition, ex exploration in his memoirs, writing, It's not getting to the pole that counts. It's what you learn of scientific value along the way. Plus the fact that you get there and back without getting killed. Thank you. Thank you Our next paper is by uh, Mr. Joe Peccicelli. It's called The Navy and Doctrinal Change, the Case of Maritime Strategy. Okay, thanks. 
slides might be slightly different than what I uh, what I'm speaking to. I think that's an earlier version, but it's close enough, and I'll I'll, I'll uh, go with uh, go with it and hope there's no uh, no differences. Um, so first off, good afternoon. Thanks to the panel and uh, all of you for taking the time to listen to my presentation. Uh, same as discussed, talking about um, uh, the case of the 1980s maritime strategy, one of the chapters in an ongoing dissertation I'm endeavoring to write. Um, and look forward to sharing some of my findings and conclusions with you. Get off to the next slide. So, uh, what, you know, what, what am I talking about here? So, uh, you know, as a, as a bit of a definition, um, doctrine, I actually don't use a doctrinally correct definition of doctrine, uh, which is more generally, in my opinion, you have tactic centric. I'm done, my definition of doctrine, I would argue, is more in line with Dudley Knox's original early 1900s article on, uh, on doctrine. Um, and I propose a definite ser service level doctrine, which is guidelines for use of, in this case, Navy, but any service force in support of national strategy, the operational level of war. So it's really what does a military force do and how does it do it, vice how individual units maneuver. Um, my research question is how and why doctrinal change has occurred in a, a variety of case studies, uh, looking at uh, or comparing these case studies to a variety of theories of military innovation. Um, and what those theories predict for uh, for change. Uh, and do so, I hope to identify at least some indications of what mechanism teams were the most significant, uh, and eventually any similarities or differences within the different cases I'm looking at, uh, and help understand something about how organizations change generally in a peacetime environment when they are not um, not not wartime change. Which I think is pretty well studied. Uh, top of the next slide. Um, so what was the maritime strategy? Um, I think most people are familiar with it, but it was a, 1980, a series of 1980s documents that uh, pretty dramatically changed the, uh, the U.S. Navy's uh, posture. Um, it all, you know, it evolved over the course of the decade. All of them were internally consistent and just built on each other, um, starting with a pre just a presentation Secretary of the Navy and then a series of formal documents. And then ultimately in 1986, a special issue of proceedings, with it, which issued authored by the CNO, Secretary of the Navy, and other senior leaders um, the, what the, for the public what the maritime strategy was. Um, at the same time, uh, you know, it was a series of exercises, and I think uh, Secretary Lehman actually argues in his recent book, the maritime strategy wasn't a document. The maritime strategy was uh, Ocean Venture 1981 and the whole series of other exercises uh, conducted throughout <laughs> the 1980s uh, that really showed what that strategy was, both to the Navy and, and to our adversary. Um, but, you know, ultimately, uh, the, the maritime strategy was used by the Navy to articulate a vision of how the Navy would fight, uh, articulate a vision, both, like I said, both internally and externally. Um, and, you know, it, even though it the document itself is titled a strategy, or it really isn't a strategy. Uh, that was the authority of the theater commanders at that time anyway. It was a doctrine for how the Navy would operate. Um, and lastly, uh, as a quote on previous slide indicated, um, why did this happen? It was, it was, it was a perfect storm, a quote, quote from Peter Schwartz's oral history. Uh, you had any number of things coming together and the, the confluence events created what we know as the maritime strategy. I'll try and unwrap that in the next slide. Uh, you have the next one. So uh, in assessing what the doctrine is at any given period, particularly since in many cases it's not written down, the Navy historically loves to not write down doctrine or even think it has a doctrine. So I kind of first step was to figure out what that doctrine was. And I looked, I basically decomposed it into four, con as it called concepts that I thought would help me understand what, what the Navy was thinking at the time. Uh, the strategic concept, really at a high level, what the Navy's going to do. Uh, an employment concept, how it's, the fleet is organized, operated, almost getting down to the operational level. Uh, the deployment concept, how the Navy has uh, off as base deployed and, and really how the, how the ships uh, operate uh, at a rotational level, both in peacetime and in conflict. And then the fleet architecture, uh, which isn't force posture, right? I mean, force or force structure that that's driven by Congress and shipbuilding, but really what the Navy's vision for the types of ships <coughs> and number of ships it, it needs are. Uh, these are very uh, uh, very oversimplifications of complex issues, but it was the easiest way to sort it out and then try and identify what changed. Um, as I show here, I have the what I, what I kind of came up with for pre-maritime strategy, the roughly the 1970s era, and the maritime strategy uh, concepts for, for this. Uh, at the strategic level, 
roughly through the 1970s, uh, the Navy was primarily supporting a ground war. Its main role was primarily preserving the sea lines of communication, so transatlantic uh, sea lift could help the the, uh, the war in uh, in the in the in Europe. Um, strategic deterrence still played a role there. There's a, there, you know, Navy, naval strike and power projection capabilities played a role, but they were secondary in many cases to just helping the army win the war in Europe. Uh, maritime strategy totally upended that, uh, called for a forward posture globally, uh, projecting power against the, uh, the Soviet flanks, uh, defeating sea denial sources at the, uh, at the sea denial capabilities at the source by waiting for them to come to you. Uh, and then once uh, defeated, uh, the most controversial aspect was going after the Soviet SSBN force itself. To some sense, that was the maritime strategy. To other extent, that was just part of the maritime strategy. Um, that's why I saw the strategic concept change. Uh, the employment concept. Um, so there were some some uh, similarities here, where again, carrier strike groups uh, remain the centerpiece of the fleet before and after the maritime strategy. Uh, the composite warfare commander concept developed. Mm -hmm. Uh, during the 1970s, remained in place and was even more fully embraced in the 1980s. Um, but the, 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 in the 1970s, one of the big differences, the forces were uh, primarily uh, thought of for a barrier strategy once uh, across the GIUK gap. Um, instead, as, as discussed earlier, the maritime strategy had the forces charging forward, operating um, on the flanks of the Soviets, uh, using techniques such as MCON transits, uh, tactical exception to operate in the face of the the Soviet threats, while well, submarine forces continue to operate forward, kind of as they always had. Um, to some extent, the Navy re-embraced re multi-carrier multi operations more in the 1980s than I would argue it had in the 70s, uh, but also included more of an emphasis on joint forces with MOUs with the Air Force, uh, and actually a relatively surprising emphasis on use of its reserve component, possibly driven by its secretary, who is also a reservist. Um, Deployment concept was pretty consistent throughout there, and really throughout the entire post-World War II era, the deployment concept's the same. Uh, it, uh, the 1970s, we had two deployment hubs, really, the Westpac and, and Europe. Uh, we added a third one in the 1980s in CENTCOM, or what will soon become known as CENTCOM. Um, but other than that, it, it really, the deployment concept is surprisingly consistent throughout this period. Uh, the maritime strategy does argue for forward posture as a, uh, as an actual mission for the Navy in a very uh, compelling way, but other than that, uh, it's relatively consistent. Um, and then fleet architecture, there were significant changes. Uh, at the same time, there was a lot of continuity in some surprising aspects. But so high low mix of the 1970s and then the later 1970s CVB, small carrier, we, we don't afford big stuff anymore. Uh, all that went away with the 1980s maritime strategy and the 600 ship Navy. It was a full embrace of large carrier. Um, at the same time, all the fleet units that were procured and really played a role in the maritime strategy were already in production in the from the 1970s, albeit in lower numbers, but they were production lines that production lines that they could just ramp up as opposed to coming up with some entirely new uh, new system. It was just really buying more of them and emphasizing the carriers more, probably the biggest change. Um, all right, so we go hop to the next slide. Uh, so looking at uh, the drivers of change, and again, this is just looking at the academic literature on military innovation. Uh, there were a number of possible causes. I'll dig into a few of these in a little more detail. Um, but uh, the, the really why would why would the Navy change? There's a bunch of theories. The one, the kind of the null hypothesis, is that change it, it occurs because it makes sense to because the adversary strategy changed, geopolitics change, and then we have to the Navy strategy has to shift uh, correspondingly, um, and just makes sense to. Um, Second theory is domestic politics and budget. That really, it's not about the Navy. It's driven by domestic politics or budgetary pressures, and it's the, the domestic drives uh, the Navy strategy. Um, a couple of the more uh, uh, mil uh, military innovation-centric theories. One is the civilian intervention theory. Uh, largely, the th idea is that you know military bureaucracies can't change. It's impossible for them to change. It takes a senior and visionary, vi a visionary civilian leader coming in. And imposing change on on an unwilling bureaucracy, um, generally with you know some mavericks from within the Navy helping him, but you know forcing the Navy to change. Um, another theory is bureaucratic competition, um, a combination of inter-service and intra-service rivalries between branches uh, causes military organizations to change, um, not just to be better military services, but really just to win bureau against bureaucratic battles and get a bigger budget share. Um, uh, another, the last two theories, so learning organization, 
so elements of learning organization capacity, such as incub incubators, um, feedback loops, advocacy networks, causes bottoms up innovation to change. So rather than the top down innovation you would get from civilian intervention, it is this bottoms up innovation. Uh, incubators are small teams that work to so kind of solve all pro uh, problems on their own. Advocacy networks are then mechanisms to communicate these more broadly throughout an organization. Um, and feedback loops and experimentation are si simply some process of taking some complete experimentation, then feeding that back to the rest of the Navy, assessing lessons learned, and, and then you know the virtuous cycle goes forward. Um, and lastly, service culture ideas, right? I mean, this is really changing changing ideas about the role of the Navy or the nation. Uh, commonly, this is Mahan at the turn of the century and his ideas driving, I guess pre-turn of the century, but his ideas driving change in the Navy and the vision for the naval forces. Um, all right, uh, so I'll hop to the next slide and dig into these a little bit more. Um, again, I'll, I'll, I think I, I'm aligned with these ones. Um, so what I argue there are two two different things that happened. There's an answer is why did the Navy change and then how did the Navy change? Uh, why the Navy change? It was primarily uh, domestic politics and adversary strategy. Uh, domestic politics, I think everyone knows, 600 ship Navy, the Reagan administration. So the Reagan administration very clearly is, is associated with this, the demand for an assertive posture um, and to, to push back the Soviets um, drove the Navy to figure out, well, I need, we need to stay aligned with that. Our current, if we're going to miss the, miss the train, if, uh, if we don't change from just providing a sea lanes of communication protection. Um, and also worth noting, Secretary Lehman, he was part of the Reagan team. He came in, he was, he is, he is an embodiment of domestic politics for the Navy. Um, adversary strategy was a little more interesting and it wasn't actually that adversary strategy appeared to change. It was the U S understanding of it. So throughout the, Throughout the 1970s, a series of analysts, primarily at the Center for Naval Analysis, had been pointing out that hey, the Soviets aren't actually trying to come through the GIUK gap. They aren't raiding the transatlantic slots. We had basically have been assuming that for many years that they would do what Germany did during World War II. Uh, and they, they kind of made the case throughout the 70s. Uh, no one really listened to them until the late 70s. And finally, in 1982, uh, the intelligence community put out a national intelligence estimate uh, that, the, that agreed with them, that, US, that the Soviet forces were not going to press forward through the GIUK gap, barring a few older diesel boats that they were willing to sacrifice. Their primary strategy was to defend SSBN bastions, so the SSBNs offering home waters defended by the Soviet Navy, and the remainder of the Soviet Navy was mainly trying to knock out U.S. power projection capabilities, which the Soviets were terrified of carriers offering in the backyard. But they were not coming for us, they were, they were in a defensive posture. Um, that kind of threw the whole barrier strategy out, out the window because, you know, the defensive line doesn't do much good if no one's going to charge into it. Uh, so taken together, there was a need for a new strategy, but I don't think that justifies exactly why uh, the strategy developed. Uh, <clears throat> hop to the next slide. Um, so uh, primary uh, cause of change I, or cause of how the change happened and what the final result we got was uh, learning organizational capacity with the Navy. So there were a number of initiatives that were, uh, many of them started in the 1970s, but really came to fruition uh, in the 1980s. <clears throat> so number of incubators, uh, small study teams that thought through the details of the strategy. Interestingly, all of them think they are the originators of the strategy and don't think the others actually played a big role. Uh, but the CNO Strategic Studies Group, uh, which Admiral Hayward established in 1981, uh, is a group of rotating post-command upwardly mobile officers spend a year in Newport thinking through hard problems, and they thought through various aspects of the maritime strategy. Uh, the Navy War College was reinvigorated uh, with, uh, around this time, uh, and it was the host for the Strategic Studies Group, and also the Global War Game and a series of other simulations that helped uh, test out the strategy. Um, the Op 603 communicate, uh, strategist community, so the, the Navy strategist office within the Pentagon, that uh, throughout the 70s, there was a lot of effort in training strategists such as Peter Schwartz and others. Um, and they, they were the authors of the maritime strategy documents. And, uh, you know, they rotated through, but they were a, a pretty consistent team. And then the advanced technology panel, which was pretty secretive, but uh, basically developed most of the anti-SSBN strategy and some others. Um, experimentation was also uh, important through this. The, all the global, the global war game and other events at the Navy War College. And additionally, uh, the, the fleet, uh, Ocean Venture 81 was the first one, but this whole series continued on where 
second fleet and uh, forces in the Pacific charge through, in this case, and then the second fleet charge through the GUK gap and right into the Soviet backyard. Uh, subsequent exercises continued fleshing out the idea of MCON transit, the idea of using Norwegian fjords for uh, evading Soviet uh, sea denial capabilities. Um, <clears throat> together, incubators and experiments took the ideas of the maritime strategy and made them something real. And then advocacy networks, uh, such as including SSG and Op 603, uh, served to build a broad base of strategy throughout the Navy, largely due to the rotational nature of the officers, guys who had ownership, who had developed it, then went back to the fleet and said, hey, this is a good idea. And that helped build uh, build some broad support for, the, uh, for this strategy. Uh, later in the maritime strategy era, uh, targeted public engagement, uh, such as via proceedings, and then a series of international security arguments between political scientist John Mearsheimer and naval Navy captains also served to, to facilitate the getting out the message part of this. Um, and then um, last thing, uh, you know, while learning, I think, is the key of this. I think Secretary Lehman also was a critical enabler. So obviously, he was a hugely important figure. <clears throat> Uh, he's an advocate for the Navy and a return of strategy, vice programmatics to, to kind of Navy planning. Um, he doesn't really fit the civilian intervention theory, though. Um, he wasn't overruling the Navy. He was really just opening the door so that the Navy do what it naturally wanted to do and kind of had been suppressed uh, from doing in the 1970s. Um, his role was to advocate for the Navy and to steamroll the bureaucracy. I started by uh, eliminating Admiral Rickover and effectively his first day on the job, uh, and then eliminated the entire Navy's uh, systems analyst shop um, when they started pushing back against uh, the, the maritime strategy. He would just fired all of them and eliminated that organization from the Navy. Um, but in the end, he didn't force change on the Navy. He just happened to be a really good advocate and spokesman for the Navy, uh, at least in my opinion. Um, so you have the last slide. Uh, what was different? Um, I'm sorry, I don't, don't have pictures in this version, but uh, what was different from other cases? Uh, so there's Elements of learning organizational capacity that lasted, that were effective, and made the strategy sticky within the Navy. Uh, most cases of the other cases I started to look at don't have that. Uh, there isn't the same overt inter service and inter service conflict. There was some. There was sniping by the Army that the maritime strategy was just, you know, a way for the Navy to get money. But there wasn't the, it's not nothing to the equivalent of the 1945 to 50 era uh, for inter service conflict. Um, there was rising budgets if they were focused on adversaries. So, Rising budgets kind of suppress that inter-surface rivalry. I mean, there's lots of money coming. It makes it easier to not fight each other. Um, and the Navy was pretty open with its communication of the change. Uh, the earlier strategies, the Navy had not effectively communicated that to the public. Um, the key elements, again, the, the need for the new strategy was driven by a change in the understanding of the adversary. The adversary didn't actually change. Uh, the domestic demand for uh, posture, a uh, sort of posture. And then, uh, Throughout the 1970s, groundwork laid, particularly in the learning organization aspects, where there were tools that were, when, when questioned, the Navy actually had an answer uh, and was able to come up with a new strategy when, when the Secretary of the Navy demanded that. So uh, that concludes my presentation. And uh, I'd like to just uh, conclude that uh, I de definitely could not have done that with Peter Schwartz, who's been a great advocate and uh, opened his archives, his personal base, his basements and archive and open that to me during the pandemic when everything else was shut down. So not not just that. Uh, Henning, thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Okay. First of all, I want to thank our panelists to, for three very fine papers. Um, you know, having come of age, okay, and my beginning my military career in the mid 1980s. I was very much influenced by John Lehman. Okay. Also, um, it's Secretary Webb as well, um, who picked Al Gray as Commandant of the Marine Corps. Papa Bear, we love him. We still love him. Mr. Siobhan, Dr. Siobhan, has written a very well written paper with a brief, though detailed, overview of Admiral Richard Byrd, USNA 1912, and his exploration of the polar region and his role as a naval aviator. What this paper to me said, okay, and I wasn't thinking of Ice Station Zebra, I mind you. Okay. <laughs> Great movie. <laughs> okay, but in, in any event, of how important Antarctica is and how Antarctica was, of course, to naval strategy. And to what I find as a common theme in all three papers as a maritime strategy. Bird's controversial career 
disliked by some in the Navy brass by thinking that it was uh, it was you know loved by politicians but hated by the Navy brass. Okay, I think that Admiral Byrd um, possibly contributed more to maritime strategy than we think he did. Um, I'm glad that uh, Dr. Chavon has mentioned the International Geographical Phys Geophysical Year of 1957-58 um, that brought to mind Eisenhower's Atoms for Peace, you know, a very strong movement in the late 1950s. And as well, and I think most important to, um, to both the Navy and to the scientific community, the scientific advance advancements that we have from our exploration of Antarctica. The question that I would have for Dr. Siobhan, okay, and I'm going to incorporate with my comments here, is how important has this been of exploration to the U.S. Navy leadership back then as it is today? Because I think that there is, you know, I think I read someone somewhere about a year ago about how the Chinese now are becoming interested in our health. So, I, you know, we, he can address that, of course, in, in, in his, uh, after I finish speaking here. Mr. Smith has given us a well and very research paper presentation on the U.S. Navy's impact on the developing U.S. USSR race in space, as he calls it in his comments, okay, that it was a, in quote, new frontier for the U.S. Navy to be looking at maritime strategy from the view of outer space. I'm glad that he mentioned the, the um, the impact of Sputnik. I know that Sputnik had a great impact on the American educational system, and I think, and still does. Space was indeed a new frontier, but as well, Antarctica as well was a new frontier for, for, the, for the United States and for the U.S. Navy in particular. And how that impacted maritime strategy brings us, of course, to Mr. Petrocelli's paper that largely and again i you know based on my comments on your chapter okay on secretary layman secretary layman i guess and i'm going to say this in my own biased opinion okay was possibly one of the finest secretaries of the navy we had although i also like secretary dalton as well and he talks about this growing impact and growing rivalry between the united states and the ussr and the u.s navy's leadership in addressing that threat but I asked him, okay, and in, in the paper you talk about Admiral Gorshkov, you know, and I remember as a young graduate student at John Carroll University, Dr. Papp, my uh, pre professor and director of the Soviet Institute, gave me as my first book to read, Sea Power in the State. And that book has had a lasting impact on me back then as it does now, particularly in this near peer competitorship that we're back into. And I ask you, okay, how much did this um, idea, okay, of the how the Navy addresses in addressing what I would call Admiral Gorshkov's um, article in Naval Institute Proceedings um, on the Marxist-Leninist view of the Navy and its impact on Soviet foreign policy and U.S. foreign policy. But altogether, these are three very fine papers because they all address various aspects of maritime strategy. Maritime strategy is important to the United States. We are all members of the Naval Services. And I think that we can see how individuals shape maritime strategy in one way or another. And Annette, I'm going to leave it to the panels to address some of the questions. Dr. Siobhan. <laughs> all right. Thank you very much. Um, pick up on that, please. Take your mask off. Yeah, I'm feeling it all right. I feel like I'm going to die. With it on. <laughs> well, um, to your question, I guess about uh, China and uh, Antarctica. I, I spent a year recently at uh, OpNav uh, N5, working on uh, op maybe operations and plans for actually for China itself and our relationship with them in Taiwan. Uh, I asked, I remember asking a Navy, a China analyst. I said, "Man, the Chinese are get, getting almost everywhere. Even the only place they're not going is the moon." And he said, uh, "No, they're going to be going to the moon." <laughs> uh, so they're they're everywhere. Uh, I I don't have a lot of tremendous uh, knowledge about their Antarctic research station. I know they have mm -hmm. at least one, maybe several. Um, and yes, that is definitely a concern 
uh, as I pointed out in the paper, of course, Antarctica is unique because it's protected by such a, mm. a treaty. Yeah, the treaty system that all nations have followed, more or less. Um, ironically, I mean, I don't know how we managed to do this. We actually set up a naval, uh, not a naval, a reactor in McMurdo for a period of time, even though I thought that was against the regulations for Antarctica. It was shut down because it couldn't work effectively under the conditions. Uh, but from the most part, nations have respected the Antarctic Treaty System. Uh, if that changes with China, you know, there is a lot of mineral wealth there that has not been mm -hmm. uh, you know, seized just yet. Uh, if that changes, then who knows what will happen down there. Uh, but uh, like I said, I pointed out in the paper, it's just fortunate that that hasn't happened for the most part. It's still largely unsupported. Yeah, so, um, yeah, first off, yeah, Secretary Lehman was an amazing character, uh, and I love, love studying him. You know, look at, you know, it's not directly answering question on this first part, but look at him, it's unclear to me to what extent is he an indispensable figure for it? Is he the mechanism of change, or is it just he is such a great advocate for it? But he was, the, the way he had been present from the 1970s through the 1980s, he was active in the 1970s, and, you know, in one of his uh, vignettes, sketched out the maritime strategy on a napkin uh, at the Black Pearl restaurant in Newport, Rhode Island, you know, in the, in the late 1970s. And that, that basically was the maritime strategy. It just, you know, turned into a hundred page document. Um, so certainly, yeah, I, I would agree. He was definitely one of the uh, more intriguing figures and uh, well-known figures of, of the era. Um, I think if I'm sharing correctly, like, uh, as, as really the, the, from the Russian perspective on this, um, I was, I'd say, I, my only comments on that are that the Russian Navy was absolutely terrified of this. Like when it, when it happened, their their view, um, they they there's strong evidence uh, from their interviews that they they could not figure out how to beat us once we started operating. And that they they tried to keep up with us for for like five years, and then they finally just gave up and accepted that we're just going to be around. You know, we're 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 a ground power, and, and we aren't going to try and compete. At, yeah, uh, naval, naval uh, putting with up. Well, they, I mean, they were, they, they were a coastal force all the way really up to the 1950s, okay? It was beginning in about late 1958, 59, that they began to slowly and modestly grow, as we I've learned you know, from the last panel, okay. okay, of naval strength, okay? But I do remember, again, you know, I mean, I was I was still, in, you know, in college, okay, okay, when this all was taking place, okay, in, in, the, in, the, in the mid 1970s, that they began developing a very robust, Power projection capability, particularly with their um, building of the, I think the Moskva and, right. um, and the Kiev class. Yeah. Uh, they were, um, and they began this, okay, of the supporting of their allies. Okay, I mentioned this earlier in my comments in the previous panel that uh, of exploiting, you know, this Marxist Leninist goal of spreading Marxist Leninism throughout Africa, Central America, as well as Asia. Okay, and, and as we retreated, they, they wanted to come in and fill the gap. But they developed their what are their power projection capabilities. They brought back their naval infantry. So they were and Lehman, I think that he was the block for that okay, because he saw that a very robust U.S. growth in the U.S. Navy would in fact deter the Soviets from adventurism on the high seas. Uh, Mr. Smith. Hello. Yeah. Okay, you, uh, your comments about the Navy and the uh, new frontier for the for, for the U.S. Navy. I think what's um, interesting and, and what the fellow panelists have picked up on um, is that maritime strategy is more or less dead in the United States by um, 1947. The 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 time that's uh, between 1947 and the 1980s is considerable. Um, which the main uh, issue I think that's going on here is, of course, the United States has the luxury of choosing maritime strategy or naval strategy or not. Uh, and that was the battle that was going on. Well, actually, all these other frontiers and issues were also being played out. Of course, the Air Force and the Army had their own agendas during this period. So um, space, I think, uh, fitted into this that there was still between all the services this um, probably an innate paranoia that unless the Soviets were engaged in all the frontiers that ultimately America was on a, a losing trend. And the other service, of course, didn't agree with maritime strategy. And I think that's very clear, particularly in the 1950s. Um, Arlie Burt, Burt by 1957 realized that there wasn't a chance of getting maritime strategy back on the agenda. It's one of the reasons he abandoned arguing completely against unification was that it just wasn't going to work. 
Um, James Postrel has experienced that in 1946 as well. So uh, really the, the frontiers argument for the Navy is still about making the Navy looking, look modern and relevant because it is falling behind until I think uh, really the 1980s and, and, and um, I, I think that's interesting in itself. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. And I would like to now open up the floor to you all out in the audience here. So, a uh, question for Jonathan. I'm Corwin Williamson. Uh, the uh, Royal Australian Navy uh, in 1946 or 47 sends a down to Antarctica as well, famously named HMAS Wyatt Earp. Uh, and so, this is a great name for ship. And I was wondering, <laughs> researching hygiene, did you run across any coordination with the Australians in this exploration of the Antarctic, or should those efforts be seen as independent staking the claims? I did not discover anything uh, directly. Uh, it was all diplomatic between the, the nations of the Southern Hemisphere, primarily. Uh, Australia, you know, and New Zealand, they raised some a lot of concerns about high jump. Well, friendly concerns. Like Argentina was a lot more hostile. It says, "What the heck are you doing down here?" Um, and uh, uh, Chile as well. So uh, the, the English-speaking nations, maybe they were a little bit okay. We, let's let's talk about this, but. But I didn't find anything directly about the wider. But why did they name it after an American? That's interesting. I think the guy, if, if the civilian ship is run of the Australian Navy, one of the Australian officers, and like, <laughs> 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 well, it, yeah, I, 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 as I broaden my uh, research, I probably will find out, find more about that. that that's that's that. Yes, back there. Question for Joseph, and great everybody. So. Why uh, was this idea of the Soviet Union coming into our claim so gripping, though, for the United States, thinking of Red Storm Rising and Team Yankee, and then the other one by um, Sir John Hatton? These are all plot points, but it's like a lot of civilian leaders also were upset with the idea that they were coming to come. I think our complex that German influence that here really in Papua New Guinea, where they come from, it's lingered a long time. Uh, so yeah, I mean, so th that's a great question. It wasn't until the 80s that the perception changed, right? Um, so I think it, it's, it is present immediately, right? Like 1946, we're worried about this with the Soviets getting a whole bunch of German U-boats, right? Um, to some extent, it was, well, that's how the last two wars played out. So we just kind of assumed that's obvious. That makes sense. And that's our big weakness is we're on the other side of the ocean. Why wouldn't they shut down our seamen's communication? Um, and the other, another, there was a technological change that happened around in the, in the 70s, 80s. Um, it also may, may have dri driven some of this. Uh, the Soviets finally basically gained that like, true the SSBN that ha could could stay in their home waters and reach the U.S. So old that Soviet SSBNs, much like our early SSBNs, had to operate pretty far forward. So Soviet submarines were coming out mm -hmm. and operating on the other side of the GNUK gap. Yep. Mm -hmm. they, they all of a sudden they didn't need to because they, they the range increased so dramatically. Mm -hmm. and, and so that them coming forward, they were coming forward. But we identified it as training for commerce rating, not, you know, SSB admissions. Right. Yes, sir. Hi, uh, Toby Silver, independent scholar. I spent a lot of my, my early days, I'm a student going into 75, before study guide. And uh, a lot of my early days was actually spent working Naval Reserve, hello. We worked in a very funny Naval Reserve unit, like an OSS, the OSS division. Everybody had academic credentials and published a book and pre service had all sorts of strange stuff. Anyway, we learned together and we analyzed Soviet naval writing of all levels. And one of the things that really fascinating to this, I've seen a lot of stuff today about a reawakening of concerns about, hey, we really need to relook at naval strategy seriously. You made a point fascinating about Admiral Dufek. Dufek and Bird, there's something else there. And it has to do with the as the Army Secretary of Defense and Wilson, the, the General Morgan. Yeah, right. <laughs> there, that particular organization, OSD, but it didn't. But what it did was they got together with the people in, in space when they put this treaty together, which is another long story that somebody needs to write. Mm -hmm. But there is a strategic reason too, because the Soviets were worried about. Well, they're not only worried, Stalin was running things so that 
Stalin had global ambitions. Okay. Stalin spent money, which was hard to come by. Got the German submarine, got the Type 21, which is the ocean going improved version. But we didn't need them. Well, I don't know, 15 or 20 of them max. But then they built about 250. Excuse me? Well, I'm not on Brad Disney's side saying, no, no, they didn't intend anything. No, 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 they did. But it changed in 53, I think. And then if you go, but, but the Antarctic stuff has something to do with some of this. I mean, you can dig around in the, in the OSD papers to find out what it is. Because uh, Dufek, particularly Dufek, had a, you know, I mean, he was, the Navy had no problems with it at all. No. Uh, but, uh, it was, you know, classic commander, really good guy, did a good job. That's the guy that he did. And it's really kind of interesting to see that. Operation Deep Freeze 1 and 2, the records of those were we'll, looking at it again. So, I have looked at his papers. Uh, at, they're, they're up at Syracuse, and uh, I did get to look at those. Uh, this is part of a larger effort. I'm hoping to do something bigger down the road, of course, with all this. But, yeah, thank you for that. That gets yeah. you the Well, the other thing, the other thing is the bastion. And that's the really big argument. And it's Lehman. There is absolutely, I mean, there's no doubt Lehman. Lehman was a historical revolutionary. You know, I read a bunch of books in Cambridge. <laughs> they didn't just roll. You could have read a bunch of books. As you look at and he, and I, he knew he knew naval history and made it march to his tune. The only time you were in an argument with Lane, you're going to find that. It's <laughs> there in the records. And, but he, he really, I, I think, I think he made the difference. Anybody else? Yes. Yeah. Hello, Benjamin Dernthal Sauer and Company. I had a question for Mr. Chauvet. Um, How did the U.S. working and training in Antarctica directly relate to us winning the Cold War, besides just showing our naval superiority? Oh, wow. Well, thank you for the question. Um, <laughs> how did it help us win the Cold War? Well, you know, as I pointed out in the paper, you know, High Jump was designed to be kind of a show of force and getting there ahead of any particular, you know, Soviet incursion. And, and like, even also as importantly, but equally as important as we're just demonstrating to again, to the Air Force saying, hey, the, the Navy is still very relevant. You, you can't do this mission. Only we can do this mission. Um, how did it help us win the Cold War? I, I think it demonstrated that the U.S. leadership in Antarctica in the region, uh, that we were the only nation that could really do this. The British were fading. They didn't have the naval superiority that they once did. Uh, I think without that expedition, without a deep freeze, that the Antarctic system, treaty system, would never have come out, or at least as favorably as it did. Uh, so that's, I think, at least how, in the 60 degree south latitudes, how, that's how we help win the war, except the Cold War, in that region. It's kind of how I would phrase it. Thank you, sir. Well, uh, here we go. Thank you. Yes. Um, it's been brought up a couple of times that in the 40s and 50s, the uh, naval strategy sort of didn't exist, um, or they were like Burke was struggling to, to develop one. And then you have Lehman and the maritime strategy developed in the 70s and 80s. And ever since, every four years or so, six years, the Navy comes out with a, new with a new maritime strategy. So what is it that you think about what happened in the 70s and 80s to create that maritime strategy and then, does anyone have any comments about how we've been using it ever since then? Yeah, so I got to guess at Lee on that one. So I, first, I, I would argue, and Michael Palmer made the argument, it's not my argument, but the for, for, there was a strategy in 1945 or 47 or whatever, and it was actually pretty close to the maritime strategy, and then we just kind of forgot about it, right? But we attack at the source was the plan mm -hmm. in the late 1940s, early 1950s. And then... Korean War, power production, and everything else kind of got in the way. Um, but I guess, yeah, what what, what happened in the 70s to make, to make it work? I, I, yeah, I think, I like Peter Scorsese's quote, it was a perfect storm, right? It was just a, a, a whole bunch of things coming together. Um, but I think the thing that Navy did, that the Navy had the ability to change, was it was coming up with um, methods for training its people in the 1970s, even under all the budgetary mm -hmm. pressure, it was reinvigorating the Navy War College in the in the 1970s 
uh, C Plan 2000, uh, or not C Plan 2000. I think it might. C, there was a C Plan in 1978, maybe. I mean, they they, they came up with analytic frameworks to consider the force structure and what the Navy could do, even knowing that like it was it was dead on arrival, right? They, the, the, those those initiatives in the 1970s largely died, but they kept the the intellectual capital being built so that when someone said, I want to do this, they could actually produce an answer as opposed to something some, someone tells you, I want to go do it. Secretary William says, I want a new strategy. And they, they all they look around and said, okay, I guess we better train a couple strategists. Um, and they're, they're, you know, the, that learning organizational capacity just made it made it sticky in a way as opposed to this, let's write a piece of paper and put out a piece of paper and then kind of move on to the next piece of paper next year. You know, a lot of times strategy, maritime strategy, has been the personalities involved. You know, uh, tomorrow morning, I'm going to be talking about two, I think, very diametrically opposed individuals, Admiral Stump and General Pollock. They both had very opposing views of what maritime, of what their view of what maritime strategy was. But they were all brought together by one man, Arthur Radford, who really had the insight, okay, in the early 1950s, okay, that he saw maritime strategy and he saw a Navy Marine team. I'm going to talk about the Navy Marine team tomorrow that he, he saw as being as the lead in this strategy against the so against the growing Soviet threat or what they perceived as a growing communist communist threat in, in Asia. So there, there was, I think what I, what I would call the bedrock of a maritime strategy that was later capitalized on of what, of what James talks about and of what you talked about in your paper too. And as well, you too, Dr. Jonathan. I mean, maritime strategy is evolving. It evolves. Okay? And I think that at the end of the Second World War, there was some conception of what maritime strategy was and what we wanted to do as, as Navy, Navy leaders and Marine leaders, okay? But it took them all coming together in the 1980s under by one strong Secretary of the Navy. Can I, I jump in on them? Um, yeah, go ahead, James. Um, uh, I'm going to slightly disagree um, with some of the panelists here and probably Mike Palmer's interpretation. Um, you know, by 1947, maritime strategy is dead in America, and the reason is there is no enemy. I, I think this is something that historians have lost sight of. Um, the U.S. Navy exists if there is a threat, um, and it was the Soviets, now it's the Chinese. So uh, uh, I think in the case of, say, Radford and Burke, Yes, they wanted a maritime strategy, but the other services in the period where the uh, Strategic Air Command, it was quite clear there was going to be, at the time they fought uh, Russians charging across the Rhine, um, there really wasn't a role for the US Navy, and they were trying to realize that without uh, winning other arguments and winning things like public relation arguments, the US Navy was in significant trouble. So uh, half of this is, is the difference that the United States chooses maritime strategy where other countries like Britain has no choice. So I think um, there has been kind of a 21st century mistake here of forgetting actually what the scenario was in the 1940s. With no enemy, what was the Navy for? There was nobody to fight. So uh, apart from Korea really bailing out the Navy, I, I think um, there has to be a caution with saying, Yes, there might have been this hope of maritime strategy bubbling around deep in, in OPNAV in the hopes of uh, naval officers' minds. But realistically, does maritime strategy become a serious discussion at the period? No, not really. Burke does push for it a little bit in the 1956, and, uh, and the other services push back so hard, he realizes it's not a fight worth having. So this picks up in the 1980s, of course, because of the Soviet Navy. Maritime strategy is coming up again today because of the Chinese threat. Um, I know I'm probably facing a room of Americans, but the chances are the US Coast Guard will outlive the US Navy considerably because there is a reason for a Coast Guard. Um, and this is just one of the facts between the difference between a continental and island nation that um, continental nations can choose their strategy, which island nations cannot. Well, you know, what, uh, I, I would like to address that question, okay? I'd like to address that. I, you know, first, first of all, no, no, you're partially you're partially the right, James, okay? From 45 to about 49, the, the services are only concerned about one thing, and it's a unification fight. They're trying to find a mission. The, the Navy, of course, wants to build the USS what? America. They want to build the Super Carrier, okay? And, of course, you have this new institution called the U.S. Air Force, okay, 
that they're now claiming that they all have the lead because of the dropping of the atomic bomb and that air power alone because of Lewis Johnson, the Secretary of Defense, of course, is, is siding on that of the Air Force, okay? But you do have thoughtful people inside the Navy. And I, I just, I'm going to have to take a, take the hit here inside the Marine Corps. You're very few, okay? Because, you know, we, we Marines think about other things, okay? You know, landing on beaches, like my wife says, you know, that's all we do is we're going to destroy things, you know? But, um, <laughs> but, 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 the, but the problem is that I think 1949, 1950 is key because they're now beginning, the, the services now are now at the fight, okay? They're now settling into their roles and they're thinking of teamwork. I know the Navy and the Marine Corps are, okay, from my, from my own research, okay? And that, you know, the Navy in the 1950s, of course, took the hit because Eisenhower was an Army general. He thought Army centric and he was influenced a lot by the Air Force. So, um, Again, you know, I think that there's been a lot of, you know, um, I, I would say a lot of what you said is true, but, you know, there are instances in the late 40s that they are thinking that we have to come up with some kind of strategy, and it's not called maritime strategy. As such, it's called amphibious warfare or, or carrier warfare or whatever, okay? But it all comes together and it all begins to gel in the late 1950s and, of course, into the 60s, into the 70s. I, I don't disagree that the Navy, the Navy kind of had a strategy, but it, I, I, th I think the Navy had a strategy in this period. I also don't disagree that it wasn't the maritime strategy because they didn't want to tell anyone. They, they, the Navy <laughs> didn't. They, we have a strategy. We're not going to tell anyone that we have a strategy. So it lived in the minds of Navy leadership, and they didn't even bother to probably explain it down the chain. Mm -hmm. it, Samuel Huntington was the one who explained that what the Navy's role in the world was in 1954. The Navy didn't try and explain its role in the world. So. It was not like the maritime strategy where it was a document and it was a strategy that was openly communicated. The Navy played I have a secret, which meant for the rest of the U.S., the U.S. didn't have a Navy, uh, maritime strategy, but the Navy had a, maybe an idea. So I, I think I, I don't entirely disagree with, with your comment that it wasn't the same as, a mar as, the, as the U.S. having a maritime strategy at the time. Yes, sir. Michael Binder, Air Force Declassification <laughs> Office. Just because you don't have an enemy doesn't mean you don't plan for the future when you will have an enemy. After World War II, only the Army Air Forces could deliver the atomic bomb. It doesn't mean that the Navy wasn't interested in developing that capability. And they worked at it, and they had a test in 1950 with a land-based plane taking off from an aircraft carrier with the ability to carry an atomic bomb and arranging for North American to design a carrier-based plane, the Savage, which would carry an atomic bomb and could take <laughs> off and land from aircraft carriers. So yes, there was no enemy, but it doesn't mean that you don't plan for an enemy. Yes, sir. Can we extend off of his question? Just try this one yeah. more time. 73 war in, in, in Israel and Israel, Egypt was a key driver of the airland battle that the Army adopted uh, over the next decade. Was there a similar, you talked about a number of drivers. Is there some kind of impetus that drove some of this, those, was a catalyst for those drivers you were talking about so well? So, good, great question. And I don't think that catalyst occurs, I think that catalyst occurs in the 70s, right? And it's really, it's really Zumwalt who said, who's saying, I don't think I can beat the Soviet Navy. And, and that was, uh, you know, Admiral Zumwalt with Project 60 and a whole bunch of changes that some of them didn't actually play out, right? But he, I think that was his, his fear. The Soviets have, all these cruise, you know, anti-ship cruise missiles, everything is armed to the teeth. And, you know, he, he, and of course he's saying this because we want more money. But he's saying, I don't think I can defeat the Soviet Navy in three well, years or whatever it was, right? So, yeah. Well, at the same time, they were pumping out attack submarines like right. crazy. And um, that's why we developed the, the, SOSA, the SOSA system. Because the Soviets were, just, were pumping out these, these uh, 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 attack submarine. Mm -hmm. A lot of them were diesel. They were actually firing them on coming up on on the continental shelf in the Pacific. Mm -hmm. So uh, we used that as one of the threats coming out of the Soviet Union, so that we can build a better surface navy, and as as well as find, build anti uh, anti submarine submarines. And that was all new because that technology didn't exist in World War II. And, and that yeah, the improving Soviet submarine technology, in particular, created a concern that even. Even if we believe that the Soviets are rushing everyone through the GAUK gap, they're getting good enough, we can't stop them. So the best way to stop them is to hit them in port, right? And right. so that 
it was it was, it was more a slow realization though. There's nothing like the '73 war. I think right. the SOSIS was not set up just to get. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When I operated the SOSA system out of uh, out of the Azores, we we could hear every one of their submarines kick start up, and what with the sound, we actually knew what submarine it was by it stuck by how the engine started. So we knew where about 82 to 85 percent of their submarines were at all times. Well, you know, one one comment that gentleman made too about the Soviet Navy. Okay, you know, the, the Soviets get nervous when we play in their backyard. I remember, I, and I remember very specifically during Operation Battle Griffin in '91. Now this goes 1991. Okay, you know I had one of the one of our radio the company come over and get me platoon come and get me. Said he goes, Sergeant Doherty. He goes, what language is it? I said, that's Russian. And I told, we're being followed. We're we're being shadowed by a what we call a crawler. Probably, you know, yeah. so they're so they're they were very interested. Okay, and also off of Havana because they were basing a lot of this off of Havana. Right. Coming in to our southeastern shore. Yeah, they were using a much larger we, diesel boat. We were on an exercise in the. Oh, I'm sorry, sir. No, we were in an exercise in the Caribbean. Okay, in 1988, and we had a Soviet trawler, you know, keeping keeping its distance, but it was out there and it was monitoring us. They were they were off Camp Lejeune. They were monitoring our communications. You know, in fact, um, I remember one. Uh, Mentioned to uh, Marshal Arkamoyev when he came to Camp Lejeune, he said that we know. He says we know because we're listening to it. <laughs> Any more questions, please? We got time for one more question. If not, I would wish. To, oh, sir. No, I don't want to take any more time. Oh, no, please go ahead. One more. Uh, go back to the King William Palmer. Oh, that is the, the the question that okay is the United States of America a are we a continental power or are we a maritime power? It seems to me we're kind of both. And it's like, uh, you know, we're not like Louis the 15th, Louis the 14th, France. Well, we're going to have a nice, but the guard, well, it might be a damn big Coast Guard. I don't know. <laughs> uh, it's, 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 and the, the Soviet concern, the real argument was well, that they really want us. Do they want to take over the world? Stalin did. He books about that. You know, okay, grab the, the German technology and cranked out these things like, you know, or whatever. And uh, he was looking on, he was looking at 15 battleships or whatever. He liked the ivory carriers. He had to send them too, but he just didn't have the money. Mm -hmm. uh, he spent as much money as he could. And Bush Cops comes along and says, I got a better way. It's mm -hmm. cheaper. And it's cheaper at the uh, strategic uh, or naval aviation. Uh, long range bombers, medium range bombers, air launch, cruise missiles. And Zumwalt was duly paranoid because we didn't have in 1973. We had CIWS just coming online, and, and so on and so forth. It just was expensive and was taking time. Mm -hmm. We were catching up because the guys figured out asymmetric warfare, not a bad idea. Mm -hmm. Let's go with these guys. And they just did it to a point where we said, hey, wait a minute, let's go after them with the bash and cheat them. Well, you know, Stalin, Stalin liked the Navy because the revolution came from the Navy. Oh, yeah. okay. And, you know, it, as a, in fact, he used the Navy to. He used the Navy. I'm sorry. I I, I, I apologize. Uh, but he used the Navy to counterbalance Zhukov in the night in mid 19 in, in you know to demystify him. Okay. Then of course he died. Stalin died. Okay. Then Khrushchev came in, and Khrushchev was more under the influence of the army leader, leadership, General Malinovko. 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 Okay. Well, listen. If there are not any more questions, I would like to thank our panelists. Give them a good round of hand. James, thank you very much. Good job. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.